Hey there, creatives. I am so excited to share this episode of the Creative Psychotherapist Voices from the Expressive Therapy Summit 2022 series. Um, Our guest is Amber Gray, and um, she has a long, uh, long list of credentials behind her name. Um, but uh, she's well known for her humanitarian work and um, really uh, working globally with um, survivors and refugees uh, around the world using dance movement therapy and somatic psychology techniques um, and uh, integrating uh, polyvagal theory and what she has termed polyvagal informed dance movement therapy. And I had a really enlightening, enriching conversation with her. And I think that you will enjoy that as well. She is going to be teaching at the upcoming Expressive Therapy Summit in Los Angeles uh, in March. And um, I highly encourage you to check out uh, not only the workshop that she'll be co-facilitating with Sharon Wheel, um, but also all of the other amazing therapists that are going to be um, providing workshops at the event. Um, And you can always learn more by going to www.expressivetherapysummit.com. All right, listen to the episode and let us know what you think uh, with uh, subscribing and liking. Um, If you're listening and you really enjoy what you're listening to, those really help us out. So here's the show. The Creative Psychotherapist is the official podcast of the Creative Clinician's Corner, a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists. TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities, and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I'm your host, Raina Lombardi, and I am delighted to welcome my next guest, Amber Gray. Dr. Amber Elizabeth Gray is a trailblazer in the use of dance movement therapy, somatic psychology, and continuum in global monthly cultural and trauma contexts. She's provided clinical training on the integration of refugee mental health, torture treatment, and creative arts mindfulness, and body-based therapies with survivors and refugees to programs worldwide. Amber developed restorative movement psychotherapy, a resilience-based clinical approach for mind, body, heart, spirit, and fuse therapies with survivors of interpersonal, complex, ancestral, collective, and multi-generational trauma. Her deep immersion in polyvagal theory birthed polyvagal informed somatic and dance movement therapies, the focus of her upcoming book. Welcome, Dr. Gray. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Raina, and call me Amber. <laughs> Please. Well, thank you for being here, Amber. <laughs> um, so, oh my goodness, where do we start? Um, what came first, your interest in dance movement therapy or um, or, uh, or, or psychology? That's an interesting question. What came first was dance. Mm. When I was a little girl, I would uh, sneak out of the house so I could dance in nature um, in the middle of the night when I was quite young. And um, I also took dance classes. I think I loved dancing in nature more. Um, So dance came first. Mm. And I mean, as I was, you know, in my formative years, I don't know that I knew that there was any such thing as dance therapy. Um, 
which really got formalized in the United States around the time I was born. I was interested in psychology. I remember when I was going to college, I don't know if it was when I was going to college or in college. And my dad was like, whatever you do, don't study psychology. And it, he wasn't, he actually was, both my parents, I mean, they, they took an oath when we were born and they vowed to one another not to um, overly influence religion, politics, or a, a profession, which is amazing. Mm. Um, but he was just like, psychologist, don't do that. Um, so I was obviously interested in it around those years, but that's, I, I didn't start there. Mm. So, so, and I ended up choosing dance movement therapy as my pathway into psychology from public health, international humanitarian work that I was doing because of what I was witnessing in the field and an instant recognition that behaviorally cognitive focused therapies were, would be extremely limited in the context that I was gonna continue to work in, which I have continued to work in, which is very global, very international, very multicultural, mm -hmm. um, very BIPOC, all of that. It was, it was very different. Sure. It's been a very different clinical journey. So, yes. Mm -hmm. And what got you involved in that work, in the humanitarian work? How did you find yourself um, going in that direction? Interestingly, we weren't a, a tr big traveling family in terms of international travel, but I, I still remember this moment. I, again, it was probably high school, college, and I was in a bar with my parents in Bar Harbor, Maine. We were and I was bringing them beers and I was having a beer. I was, so it must've been college. <laughs> and I said to them, I, I wanna travel. I'm gonna be a Peace Corps volunteer. I don't know what happened that I just announced that, but, um, and I did join the Peace Corps. Um, I did do a little travel before that. I, I, I left high school early and took off, I worked in a diner, like the early, early, early morning truck, trucker shift. And then worked literally on an assembly line and made widgets. I don't even remember what they were, these little things I had to keep making over and over and over for hours and raised money and took off and went to Europe. Oh, wow. So that's when I started traveling. And then the Peace Corps was really um, just an extremely illuminating um, mm. experience. I chose Guatemala. Um, I had a choice between Guatemala and Honduras and chose Guatemala. And it was when the Civil War was still raging in the North west portion of the country and i was the first group sent into what had just been a, a war zone it was this mm. was a civil war this was rios mont it was that time period so i often call it the breaking wide open you know in my consciousness and my 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 witness to what goes on in the world um because i was in a community where months before people would wake up in the morning and there would be dead bodies in ditches so i had this um and I was also in an indigenous community, which is what I wanted to do and witness the oppression of the indigenous sure. original, um, original dwellers on the land because they weren't mm -hmm. occupants, they dwell on the land by a colonial, um, you know, colonialism. So all of that was very illuminating for me. And I began to traverse international work and humanitarian work and development work. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, Obviously, in those situations, um, lots of healing is needed in order to move past, move through, um, integrate uh, all of that history and surviving those kinds of events, um, which this is what brought you into the work that you do today and, um, and pursuing a uh, career in expressive arts therapies and, and somatic therapy and dance movement. Um, how did you, how did you begin to um, learn about and integrate uh, the work of uh, polyvagal informed approaches into your treatment and, and the work that you do with individuals? So, well, it's actually the integration of polyvagal theory. Um, polyvagal informed is um, what I started calling my work with um, Stephen Porges' blessing in about 2015. The term is actually being 
used quite broadly now. Um, okay. You know, you know how that happens. Things get popularized, but it yeah. was a very intentional naming of of my integration of polyvagal theory, which which I have immersed myself in since 1999. So I met Steve at a conference. I was utterly moved and transformed by what he said. Mm. And we talked during a break. I asked him a question and he asked me to meet him during a break because I was talking about face-to-face -face engagement in the actual exposure. I was talking about working with torture and we became friends and I consider him a friend and a, a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, lots of informal conversations, lots of seeding ideas, lots of back and forth. We've taught together in Australia, Denmark, Norway, here, Santa Fe, many different places. And so we were writing a chapter together for a book and I decided that I like to call it polyvagal informed. And I think, and I do think, and I say this, you know, with humility, but that was the first use of it. A lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, are using it now, but, it, but it, because it was polyvagal informed dance movement therapy and somatic psychology, it was how the work was, has shifted and changed um, as, you know, as a result of integrating that work. I, and, and when I call it the work, um, what I liked, my, I already had a body of work called mm -hmm. restorative movement psychotherapy. And that name just came because I needed to, as I started teaching a framework that, you know, I don't, I, I did not develop. It's a co-collaboration with my clients and myself. Mm. And it, it's, so it's a co-collaboration. And as it started organizing itself through lots of, I documented a lot and, you know, I would try things and keep track of what I was doing. Um, it became a body of work and it had a name. And so the polyvagal informed, I would say, is the update. Like it's, you know, like how we update our computers. It's the sure. updated version. <laughs> I still kind of use both because I like, I believe in bowing, you know, to the elders and honoring the ancestors. So there's this lineage here, but mm -hmm. I would say my work is equally polyvagal informed, human rights informed, because I've always worked mm -hmm. with survivors of human rights abuses, whether it's political torture, genocide, war, um, racial trauma, mm -hmm. um, and also spirit. I, I've had a lot of, um, I've been very blessed to be adopted by a few sp spiritual um, medicine people, medicine mm -hmm. people or mystics in, in some of the places I've worked. So oh, wow. that's part of it too. So it's, that's, it's really a, a synthesis of all of that. And it's, you know, it's evolving all the time. It's not fixed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dynamic. Yeah, oh, very ever, dynamic. It's relational. Mm -hmm. It's relational. Changing. I mean, and that's some of that. I'd say my awareness. It's always been relational, but my the polyvagal theory and Steve's very generous mentoring has really helped me. Um, I would say be more consciously relational and and bring that into you know not just sessions but the development of the work and the sharing and teaching and disseminating of it. Mm -hmm. And now writing about it. So, I know. I feel like now um, his his work is more largely disseminated and more people are familiar um, with his work and polyvagal theory. However, I do still talk with some people, therapists that haven't heard about it and aren't yeah. familiar. Could you share a, you know, a, a short brief synopsis of kind of the core tenets of um, of this work and, and what it's about. Sure. Um, I think what attracted me to polyvagal theory, I'm going to start there. Yeah. Was the recognition that the human nervous system is actually a process. I'm going to put this in my words, a process, um, and the current process, the current way that the human nervous system guides and facilitates, seeks safety, scans mm -hmm. for danger, um, is, is, is an evolutionary pathway. Mm -hmm. And what really um, grabbed me when Steve was talking was, was, the, sh was the shift from the old, um, the old model that was talked about in terms of, you know, a stress response um, leading to states of traumatization, 
um, that are the consequence of a um, paired antagonism, the sympathetic adrenal and the parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system being you know, heightened or on or however you wanna put it at the same time. And his deep research and recognition that actually there was another what I, response, um, I actually call it a reaction, two moments of exposure mm -hmm. um, that happens in service of survival. And so, and that's the, that's the dorsal vagal shutdown. And in the first, I'd say from 99 to 2010, 11, I was constantly correcting people on, on what that really is. There is a freeze response, which is, you know, that yeah. paired antagonism, that sympathetic, parasympathetic. There's also a complete shutdown that bypasses the natural hierarchical order mm -hmm. in which, um, the, you know, the nervous system has developed and the vagus, the vagus nerve, um, the unmyelinated dorsal vagus, you know, the myelinated ventral vagus. And so that is what really spoke to me. And so I think what, you know, is really helpful for therapists to understand we're more than our nervous system. We're a composite of so much nervous system, body, biology, physiology, um, spirit, mm -hmm. history. However, our nervous system is a living legacy that is committed to our survival. And that in the face of adversity, mm -hmm. danger, which promotes fear, life threat, which promotes terror, it's different than the old stress model, um, that we will recruit old physiologically based behavioral strategies that save us. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was also the non-pathologizing of that. It, it's the, it's the mm -hmm. celebration of our capacity to do that. And the imprint that that leaves, um, especially if we don't get early resourcing, early support, you know, it, it might be therapy. It might not, um, become what we might call symptoms or complaints. Mm -hmm or behavioral issues. Right. So I hope that was I, I've ex I beautiful. Just that. that was different than how I usually explain it, but I like to do something different every time. So that gift, you know, and it, and it so it affects literally how we move in the world mm -hmm. because we're, the imprint is physiological. It affects how we move in the world. Yeah, it was a beautiful explanation. And, um, and I too appreciate the, the destigmatization of yeah. it that this yeah. is this is a this is just a part of human biology and the way we're we're all made up and it it really normalizes it because for so many people as you well know um to yeah. speak up about a, a trauma there's so much shame that's uh yeah. built up around it um that there's something wrong with me or yeah. or yeah so. And I'm glad you said that because I just, one of the things, and this is going to be the, you know, a, a focus of my book, um, because I've worked in, you know, low resource contexts, I don't always work in a nice therapy office. I'm on the streets of Port-au-Prince against massive piles of garbage that haven't been moved in months. Um, sometimes I have to duck and cover because there's gunfire. Um, you know, Darfur when there's a uh, ambush going on outside and we have to stay uh, you know in in the same room for like six hours or something like that um because of the context that I've worked in what I've become really interested I mean I you know I work as a regular clinician I use various psychometrics and all of that but what I'm really interested in is empowerment and that's a word that actually sometimes honestly makes me gag because it gets used so much in, in ways, um, fluffy ways. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but um, it's, it's restoring dignity. It's restoring mm. um, a sense of wholeness to people. That's how I look at it. It's restoring belonging. Years ago, I started promoting belonging as the ultimate clinical outcome. That term is used more um, now. So yes, what poly, what I have seen polyvagal theory, which is what I, I used to teach that, my version of it. Now I teach my work, um, polyvagal informed somatics, polyvagal somatic um, movement therapy, and it empowers people. People go, I'm okay. 
my body is taking care of me. So you just, you just said that. And I just wanted to, ref, you know, mirror that back because it's so important. That is so restorative for people. It's so restorative to know yeah. why it's happening, to understand that their body is looking out for them. Yeah. That it's not doing anything wrong, yep. you know, yeah. that, that becomes, that's so hard, I think for so many people. And once they have the education and information, it really, it really can create so many breakthroughs and transformations for them to go, okay, and breathe easier and just, just let that out. Um, really powerful Absolutely. work. Yeah. So as you were, as you were sharing about the locations of, in, in which you work, where there is so much active, um, trauma and violence happening as a therapist, who's caring for people that are surviving these experiences, how do you take care of you? So, cause you're in it too, at the same time. I am in it too. And I'm a visitor. Mm -hmm. So, and that doesn't mean that I'm not in it, but the, and this is, you know, my more political activist side speaking, but, and this has um, been a challenge. I, this has been one of the challenges I've encountered in humanitarian work. It's still very colonial humanitarian work. It's still linked to colonialism. It's often, yeah. you know, we come in, you know, the saviors, you know, dominantly, you know, dominant culture. Um, it's changing. It's changing. And there are some people waking up about that, but I can always leave. No, not always. I mean, you know, yeah. When I was in Darfur, I couldn't just say, okay, I'm walk to the airport. I think it was a 45 minute hour drive. You couldn't travel without an armed UN. Um, what do you call it when there's a row of cars driving? Convoy. A for that. Convoy. Convoy. Thank you. You had to have a convoy. Um, you know, you can't always, but, you know, I remember when I was running a victims of violence program in, in Haiti in 2004, when Aristide had been removed, um, when it got really dangerous, you know, we were evacuated. I didn't want to leave. I went kicking and screaming. Um, and I'll never forget standing in line at the airport and all the Haitians who really wanted to leave and had no prayer of getting out. I mean, and I sobbed. I remember when I checked in at American Airlines, I was just crying. And the woman finally looked at me. She said, look at, I get it. If I could get on your plane, I would. Stop crying and get on your plane. You know, it's not your, she said, it's not your country. It's not your problem. I'm actually deeply connected to Haiti. So I, but she, you know, she just, she was, she's like, I would take your place, but I can't get on the plane and get mm -hmm. out of here. So we can leave. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be more protection for international. I think that's, that's eroded quite a bit. Um, partially because there has been some frustration in, in local contexts with how you know, the international community has often come in and not respected local culture, local spirit, local ground place. Right. Uh, um, but so I'm not in it in quite the same way. Um, often we stay, you know, in, in the earthquake. I mean, yes, some of us were staying in tents. I had a friend's house to stay in. They find the place where we can be as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. We might not be on the streets. We have access, you know, they fly in food and water. So, it, so it's slightly different and it's still very hard. Um, yeah. We might not have gone through, you know, I often like the earth, I didn't go through the earthquake itself. I, you know, I didn't go through the, you know, in some of the conflicts I've worked in, even though it's active, I haven't been in some of the attacks that my mm -hmm. clients or the people that I was, you know, often I'm doing training. So it's different. It's different. There's a, um, there's distance. Yeah. There's emotional distance there, but I still think as, you know, therapists, we're, we're empathic people. And as you described the, how you were feeling about having that privilege to be able to leave, knowing that there are all these people that couldn't, right. It's that witnessing, even if we weren't there during the act the witness of 
what has happened, um, I mean, it's impossible not to have an emotional reaction yeah. to that and, and feel deeply about it. Well, what I feel deeply is what is becomes the fuel, right, for the fire that burns in me. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, and I actually, I, I'm very con conscious about witnessing. I believe that actually witnessing is a very powerful act and I link witnessing to compassion. So one of the um, sort of, one, one it's, this is part of restorative movement psychotherapy. One of my, it, I always start in terms of clinicians when I'm training people or training anyone, I always start with the self. I could say self-care. I call it, I like to call it self-respect self-love, self-compassion. I've been using those terms for about 15 years. And one of the things that my clients taught me very early on is that if I only respond with empathy, um, it can be very unnerving to survivors of interpersonal abuse because sadistic abusers recruit empathy to increase their victim suffering. Yeah. So I started to really sit with the difference between empathy and compassion. I see them as deeply linked, but compassion as further along evolutionarily. And I've been doing a lot of just personal research on that. Um, so I practice compassion and mm. compassion is more protective. And compassion is that non-attachment the Buddhists talk about. It's a different way to respond. Um, lots of people, I remember the Jeremy Rifkin video, um, what was it called? The empathic civilization, you know, mirror neurons, empathy, hallelujah. I mean, he's saying, you know, we're, we can be such, we can be this great civilization because of empathy. Empathy is what connects us. It's how we, you know, it's that shared mm -hmm. body state. It can be um, exploited in service of cruelty of with course. compassion. Cruelty is not possible. So I try to maintain a compassionate state. And I think that has made a huge difference. Thank you for elaborating that that really is um, a, a beautiful and important uh, differentiation between the two, really powerful for sure. Um, what would you say has been um, the most, I guess, uh, uh, challenging, challenging work that you've done um, as a uh, dance movement therapist, somatic therapist, um, humanitarian, political activist, it seems like you're really integrating all of these different parts into everything that you do. What's been the most challenging part of that work for you? The Haiti earthquake because Haiti's my spiritual home. And um, it was that, that was an example where even though I wasn't in the earthquake, it was my, it's my home. I'd spent already by 2010. And of course we just passed the anniversary, the 12 year anniversary um, on the 12th. That, I mean, I can still remember when I was learning about it and um, that night and it was, very personal because so many of my friends and family are there, um, mm -hmm. spiritual family and deep personal concern, loss. You know, I lost friends in the earthquake. I had friends texting me from under rubble, um, asking for help. I went down there right away. It was, you know, physically toxic. It was emotionally intense. You know, I witnessed bodies being retrieved. I helped teams get to where people were they, you know, were trapped. It was, and I was doing the work. So I would say that was the most difficult. I remember and long days, very long days, as is, you know, common and appropriate in a true emergency. I mean, of we, course. you know, it's not, it's not like, okay, it's, you know, I'm going to take my break. So I'd often not get home till eight, nine, 10 at night. I would always take a shower. A hot, I was able, I had hot water where I was staying. It was a house that was not that affected. It was a little bit up the hill and had a few cracks. It was my dear, dear friends, my, their family to me. They had left. So they were actually really glad I was there tending to the Taking house, the house yeah. and their cat and a couple dogs. Um, and 
every morning I got up and meditated, no matter how exhausted I was, the alarm went off at, you know, 5.30, 5.45. And I just made myself sit for 10 minutes and look at a candle. I just did a very, it's actually a, a, from, from my spiritual tradition, from Vodou, I worked with candles and I just did that to start every day. And when I could, I danced. I was there, this was not early on, but maybe four or five months in when a few dance studios, when they'd gotten things cleaned up and um, I would go dance if I could for, you know, sure. I was at the opening of my favorite studio and we did a big dance class and I would um, practice dance what you I preach. Could. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Love that. So what would you, um, what would you say if people came to learn from you and came to uh, a training that you're offering, such as the one that you're going to be teaching at the upcoming Los Angeles uh, Expressive Therapy Summit in um, March of 2022, what are some things that people would take away from your training that they might not experience somewhere else? So I'm um, going to be co-facilitating with my beloved friend and utterly brilliant colleague, um, Sharon Whale, and um, we're both continuum teachers. So the emphasis will be on continuum, and I'm pretty certain nobody else at this at the at the summit will be doing continuum. Um, I will be bringing all of my work, however, and you know we are going to have some some theory. It'll be very experiential. And I would, I would reflect back to what I said about compassion. Um, you know, we're working with um, resilience um, or resistance, you know, navigating um, change and, and embodying change. And these have been times of just extreme and extraordinary change. Right. So it will be a very current, very real in the moment, in our bodies, exploration mm -hmm. of how compassion is made manifest how it blooms in the body in our in our you know in our actions. Um, it will be probably less theoretical than I, if I was going to do a polyvagal informed dance therapy um, training. Mm -hmm. it, it will be more I think organic. You know, again, seasoned. You know, like salt mm -hmm. and pepper with with some theory, absolutely. And I'll always be open to questions, but it'll be it'll be the embodied in in body exploration mm -hmm. of the polyvagal informed work that I do the spirit informed work Sharon is utterly brilliant she's been a continuum teacher 40 something years um you know has developed her own body of work she's also very much an activist so it'll be very um very engaged mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for people that might not be familiar with the work of Continuum, can you share a little bit about what that means? Um, it might be maybe, maybe more in depth um, if need be, but just so that people that, maybe, that may not be familiar um, could better understand what that means. Absolutely. Before I do that, I'm just going to say it's also going to be portable. People are going to leave our training, our, our session with skills, with yeah. new awarenesses. So it's portable. It will become part of them, their bodies, their souls, their hearts. So continuum. Um, another amazing mentor, Emily Conrad, uh, who died in 2014. Um, this is her body of work. She... Um, you know, make a long, her book is Life on Land. I'll, I'll say that if anybody becomes interested in it, but she, um, after a, a childhood and adolescence rife with suffering, um, found dance. Dance was her healing, her, her sanctuary, her salvation. And she ended up in Haiti, um, which is part of how we connected in 1955 on a scholarship to study Dunham technique, which dancers will know is one of the modern dance techniques. Um, Catherine Dunham traveled to Haiti um, and integrated Haitian dance into, into modern dance. Um, while there, Emily became involved in the spiritual practice. She was an initiate 
and um, she talks about, um, she writes about this in her book, and at experiencing Haitian dance, which is, you know, we can go to Haitian dance classes and learn steps, but the heart, the root, the soul of Haitian dance is how our feet listen to, listen to the earth mm-hmm. and how the drums also listen to the earth. The drummers are listening to the earth. Um, deep knowledge of the spirits that, that are, um, the spirits that we serve and that serve us. Um, and it's a, it's a call and response. It's, it's probably one of the most profound examples of reciprocity in the world because it's between earth it's between spirit, sky, it's drummers d- playing drums that were once trees and once animal skins that are deeply acknowledged, the lives mm-hmm. that become part of, you know, that call that brings up the, the call that makes the rhythm audible, the dancer's feet that makes the rhythm visual. Um, she dropped into what's below cultural dance. And so, you know, the work originated there in her body, in her experience of it and has transformed and, you know, morphed and been influenced by many, many, many other things that she, you know, she took that. Um, she would always say to me, this is my, this is my service to Dambala. This is my, who's one of the, the Loa, our spirits. Um, but she started to look at movement, you know, without cultural layers and wave motion is what she started exploring. And so Continuum has become this extraordinary practice birthed in the laboratory of her own body of how we can self-sound and self-choreograph our own organic movement. So initially she used um, external music, some, 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 sometimes we still do, but she actually started playing the same principles of ultrasound. Um, you know, you, if you get ultrasound in PT, they're putting sound waves into you. Mm-hmm. Different sounds create different frequencies. Mm-hmm. We do this as kids often. We get in under a swimming pool or a bathtub and we go, and it's really, so our body is 80% water. So when we sound ourselves, mm-hmm. we're actually affecting our internal tissue. We're 80% fluid. So the different sounds and sounds, it's really breath made audible. So we're really working with breath, which is right, our connection to spirit. Um, we become our own inner choreographer. And what we do is we wake up organic movement, which might be deeply still, might be very meditative or contemplative. It might be dynamic, you know? I mean, I've done things in continuum when I'm, you know, suddenly, because when breath and movement are married as they're meant to be, a lot of restrictions and constrictions, actual physical ones, scar tissue, dissolve or shift, you know? It's not an instant miracle, as does emotional and psychological resistance, because all of that is born in our physiology, in our body. So Mm -hmm. that's what continuum is. It's the exploration of our natural, organic, oceanic movement. Um, It's reclaiming how we move. Mm. That sounds amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. And I, I loved the description of, you know, the, the feet listening to the earth and um, that connection spiritual connection that that it's it's such a holistic approach to um, caring for oneself Um, and I think you know hearing hearing you talk about your work and um, doing the humanitarian work I think that's where the expressive arts can be so powerful and and going in those places because we can pull from people's um, natural modes of expression and their own cultural experience and um, where they're at, uh, which is so beautiful. I I agree wholeheartedly. The expressive arts, I, I always say that life is, I always say life is a creative process. So healing, restoration, you know, is also must be creative. Life is also expression. It, I mean, it's our expression, yeah. right? This is our expression. Gene this, expression. I don't know if it's my one and only expression because I don't know if I believe in reincarnation. I'm open to the idea, but it isn't just that we express ourselves in like this. We are an expression of whatever our, this is my belief, you know, whatever our soul or spirit came in to do or energy, you know, if we're not. So yes, expressive arts. Um, it's, you know, a, a, an amazingly homeopathic, um, 
you know, it's like meeting self with self. That's who we are. So I can't imagine doing this work without expressive arts, without dance and movement. I'm so glad I'm not limited to words. <laughs> but that, would, that would be really, really hard yeah. to to do that kind of work if it was solely about words. And I, I mean, even when we have the same language, it's hard to, it's hard for many of us to put words to uh, experiences that um, are, are so difficult. So we need Sometimes other ways. There are no words. Yes. No, 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 yes. absolutely. I agree. There are no you. words sometimes. There's not words for what people have experienced. Mm -hmm. And it's so we, we disrespect them when we try to put them in boxes and words. Yeah. 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 Powerful. Yeah. So for people that might be interested in, um, in you and your work and your latest publications, where can they find more about you, Amber? www.ambergray.com. That's my website. Um, it's It's been a little bit quiet. I spent the last year caregiving two parents who I lost in summer of 2021. Um, so sorry. So I'm just, I always say, thank you. I'm like, there's these glass things that have thick liquid in them and like little bubbles rise up slow that's me right now I'm coming back slowly I um I, I stopped working for many months and I'm so grateful that I did that and yeah. so but there is some stuff and also COVID I mean I was doing a lot online the first year and then I started caregiving I was my mom's full-time caregiver and then my dad got sick so haven't been doing as much and I don't people keep saying are you gonna do more I'm like I don't think so I'm sick of it and but I might you know if we stay in this I might generate some more online um workshops but there's some live stuff coming up um and there's okay. going to be more and I also you know I Facebook I'm I'm, I'm social media I, I'm getting used to it um Amber Gray movement therapies I have a Facebook page I always forget what my Instagram is um I think it's restorative resources, which is my business name. I tweet. I haven't tweeted in a while, but I tweet things out um, periodically. And it's and would that be Gray. Amber Gray as well? Yes. <laughs> on, on Twitter. Yes. Oh, Amber um, Gray. Awesome. And um, would they find your books on your website? No books yet. Um, no I've books written a yet. lot of chapters and a lot of um, articles and there's some on there, you know, and there's, but there's, there's the name of everything that's there. Cause I can't put everything out in public domain, oh, but there's, sure. there's the resources page and all of that. Yes. Um, Perfect. Cause that'll be work. able to, if I can put the resources list in the um, show notes and anybody that wants to learn more about your work and, and your approaches um, can find that literature and purchase it on their own and, um, you know, view it that way. And you're going to be teaching at the upcoming summit. And I, and I have the name of your session. Uh, so for uh, listeners that are interested in attending the upcoming LA Expressive Therapy Summit, Amber is going to be teaching a workshop called Resistance or Resilience, Inhabiting the Movement of Change. And that'll be on Saturday, March 26th. 2022. And I'll put the link um, to that also in the show notes. It's www.expressivetherapysummit.com. Um, but it, this has been really amazing to speak with you today and hear Ew. from your wisdom. Um, I really appreciate you making the time. Well, you're so welcome. And thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Creative Psychotherapist podcast and this Voices from the Expressive Therapy Summit 2022 series. I really hope that you enjoyed listening to this conversation with Amber. Um, there were so many things that she shared that I just 
deeply connected and resonated with, I think, the way she differentiated empathy and compassion is so profound and powerful. And I just love that perspective. Um, and I'm going to be thinking about things much differently as a result of this conversation with her. Um, there was also at the end where she was talking about the continuum work and um, the soul of Haitian dance and that connection, that relationship between the earth and the person's feet dancing um, was just such a rich and beautiful and honoring way of talking about the process. And I, I just really hope that you enjoyed uh, this conversation as much as I had having it. And um, thanks so much for listening. And again, if you're a longtime listener and you haven't liked or subscribed yet, please do so. We greatly appreciate the support, helps others learn about these conversations that we're having um, about the expressive therapies and, um, and the work that we do as therapists. So we appreciate your listening. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.